Okay, everyone, welcome back to Feel the Force. Uh, it's Jesse again, and we are starting our new interview series on astropsychology with Georgios. What is, how do you pronounce your beautiful surname? Um, I guess there's no wrong way to pronounce it. It's in German, Georgios, but you yeah. don't have to pronounce that. Okay. You can just say Georgios, that's fine. Sure. Yes. Or you can just say George. Well, there we go. So, yeah. So, Georges is a, a specialist in astropsychology and uh, detox and trauma. And if you don't mind saying a little bit more about yourself and what you do, um, that would be amazing. Yes, thank you very much for introducing me. So, I work as a somatic practitioner, which means I originally actually come from a psychological background where I learned about different healing modalities. And eventually, I found my way through a friend to astrology who introduced me to the fact that you can actually use astrology to diagnose people's uh, mental health background. Now, while a lot of people have problems with this idea, I actually found that you can find out a lot about the family history, the past, and everything that has led them to this point of how they psychologically de developed through the chart. So I started to learn astrology and I combined these two things. And on top of that, I was doing a lot of detoxification. I was giving uh, consultations to people because I went very far with it. I did a lot of study on it. So everything somehow it came together. From all these different healing modalities, you could say I became a jack of all trades. And somehow it's all connected, I found out. And I was able to put everything together. And I read a chart, I can see the health weaknesses of a person, their psychoanalytical traits, their trauma background, their father, their mother, their childhood. If you have enough experience after at least 100 readings, which I've done in the last two years, then you pick up on a lot of things that you cannot normally find in a book. So we now have the idea, we make a series on psychoanalyzing all um, the gurus that we think are interesting to analyze, which is part of a new age community. Um, gurus are teachers. Like the ones you mentioned, uh, Teal Swan, um, Alan Watts, this guy, uh, Rolf Smart. You know, people who have a certain profile in the public. And when you have the charts online because they are so public, then you can look a little bit into their private life, which is normally not so public. Mm -hmm. So we thought it would be interesting to take a look at that to make videos, interviews about who these people are from their natal chart and why did they become gurus? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for that. And I can attest personally that um, Georgios is the ideal um, astrologer if you want to have your, your birth chart read or your soul chart read or um, anything else in terms of, you know, somatic... Uh, trauma therapy so i will post um if you're right with that georges the links below for your services if people are interested uh, later on thank you so yeah no i just wanted to kick off with um the sort of most influential leader of the the, the 60s countercultural movement uh alan watts himself and um he famously said, you know, I'm not a guru, I'm just a spiritual entertainer, and um, I'm a genuine fake, I'm just playing the role of Alan Watts, you know, and he, um, he, he was quite God complexed, but in a not an arrogant way, um, his idea of God, and the universe was essentially um, love play, like it's a essentially loving and playful universe. 
and he gained access and insight to this uh, revelation through the use of you know psychedelics like LSD, for example. And um, so, yeah, he was born on the Epiphany, January 6, 1915, and he's a Capricorn. And um, the first sort, sort of uh, initial phase of his life was um, already quite significant in that he went to Eton, no, not Eton, um, Canterbury School, and was a, a prefect there. So he was already kind of like a leader, uh, head of house there. And after that, he uh, was admitted as a member in the uh, the Buddhist lodge in London as a kind of in influ influential figure there and studied under um, quite um, uh, an influential figure who took him under, who took Alan under his own wing there. And he, in, he enjoyed a, a social club or a, it wasn't really a secret society, but it was kind of a social club called the Wild Woodbines, uh, kind of a gentleman's club alongside the whole Buddhist um, lodge initiation thing that went on. And that was only up to age, you know, what, 16 to 18 already. So obviously his life um, was is already spearheaded by this sort of Capricorn energy um, with the Sagittarius ascendant, as it can be shown in the chart. And um, could you like sort of elaborate up, upon that on what, how does that form a kind of leader who was influential? you know, so soon in his life. Yeah. So normally, I look at the chart, and if I ask a question like that, like, why would we be a leader, for example? Why would we be, like, a strong personality? I usually look at the firehouses, because the firehouses rule the identity. So if you have placements there, it means that the house is very active. There's a lot going on there. And that is how it is in his chart. Because he has four aspects in the first house. And by the way, um, before I talk about that, we are using the tropical system. And I'm using the campaigners house system. Now, the only difference between the campaigners and Plato system is that it's based on uh, space instead of time. And the difference is very minimal. So any house changes you see, it's only by like so few degrees that some placements could be in two houses at the same time. But based on his tropical natal chart, he has Mars, Sun, Mercury, and Uranus in the first house. So that's four planets in the same house, the house of identity, which is a firehouse, which is about him. Like, what do I want to get out of this? That's basically will always be on his mind. What do I get out of this? Right? It's about will. It's about what you want. And the sun is conjunction Mars. So that's very strong. And because it's in Capricorn, which is a very ambitious place and for this Mars, he will be thinking about how to get money, about doing what he wants to do. So mm -hmm. these kind of personalities, you'll actually see them quite often in a teacher position or leading position, like CEO, uh, a businessman, or something like that. They embody the masculine archetype of the king, like someone who is in charge. That's very important with these placements to keep in mind, because his motivation is very similar to some other leaders you see. For example... I know one person who has exactly the same placements, which is Dr. Sebi. Mm. Like, you know, he's a detox specialist, yes. of course. And he was exactly the same kind. He's the kind of guy, he tells you what to do because he wants you to do something based on how he does things. So he just does them. So he gives you basic instructions with the Capricorn spirit. And with a Sagittarius Ascendant, it's very obvious that this is someone who wants to preach 
about how to live, how to do things, because we are an educator, the Sagittarius rising. And again, it's a fire sign. So it's connected to the far placements. And outside of that, you have a very, very masculine chart. So every time you look at the chart, is it masculine or is it feminine? Here it's masculine based on um, the rising and the air placements. Midhaven, Jupiter, Uranus, Saturn, um, Visa and Air on one hand. And I say masculine because even though he has obvious placements in Capricorn, which is a feminine sign, and he has Moon in Virgo, you have to keep in mind that the energy behind these placements is very mental. It's not an intuition, emotionally based energy. Even though it's Earth placements with Capricorn and Virgo, I still look at it as if it's a masculine individual because they get things done through their mind, not so much through feeling. Yeah, that's so interesting because uh, his videos or well, recordings, obviously, um, when you listen to him, uh, I've had certain people around me say, oh, he's too intellectual, he's too mental and um, too too dry and, and philosophical. It's all mainly up here and not so much. The dry is very much earth element, yeah, dry. They just give you the facts. Yes, yeah. Uh, and they do it well. They yes. stick to the details. And they're very, very smart, Virgo Moon. Intelligence is very important for these people, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think one of the major criticisms of Alan Watts is that um, it was uh, overly dry philosophical speculation um, that was, and he was just hyper intellectual and scholarly. Obviously, he he knew so much uh, in terms of theory and um, literature. I hear this argument a lot. Yeah. Like the person is hyper intellectual, they talk too much. You know, if you think about it, his videos, which are his recordings on YouTube, that got later introduced. They're very long. He's talking a lot. He's talking very long. He goes really into details. It's not everyone's cup of tea. Not everyone has the mental capacity and the attention span to follow that. So that is why you see a lot of his criticism. And of course, this is not a religious kind of person. Even though he has the Sagittarius ascendant, he really sticks to the details so people who are normally into meditating a lot into spirituality a lot they may not always like what he's saying just based on that alone yeah uh, it's very true um not everyone's cup of tea obviously and um yeah, I mean, for instance, um, w when I listen to him, he he kind of almost like a a Bach a con concerto. He 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 has a way of putting everything in its right place. There's like a sort of a sort of divine order in what he says. And one one thing he did say famously was that you know you shouldn't take yourself seriously, but sincerely, which is a a subtle difference, but there's a whole gulf of difference there. Like it's serious, you know, it's real, but it doesn't really matter. So you shouldn't take yourself so seriously. It's very interesting what you're saying. To take yourself serious is very much a Capricorn thing, mm. but the Sagittarius thing is the sincerity, is the most straightforward, honest sign, right? So he, he basically is talking about himself, about the transition that he made and how he handles himself. So the personality very much comes out in what he's teaching. And the other thing, when we talk about his placements more in detail, he has Jupiter conjunction North Node. And the North Node is about what you're going to do, what you're going to learn about doing. So this is usually expressing in later life. 
So this person really was born to be a teacher anyways. But to be a Jupiter type of teacher, as a North Node, that means he didn't embody that energy very well in his earlier life. So maybe the way he embodied it was more um, kind of keeping to himself, staying with the details, focusing more on that. And that is why he's more refined with all the details. And maybe if he found a way to do it more Sagittarius like, he would be more liked. Because what a Sagittarius does, a Jupiter person does, they give you striking thoughts. They say a sentence and it's like, just like, oh, okay, this hits me. Like, this is the whole teaching, this one sentence. That's all I needed to know. So this is came, coming more in his later life. Yes, in fact, he seemed to have really come more into his own personality, this sort of jovial sage personality that perhaps he didn't fully embody in his you know, 20s and 30s. Because in his 20s and 30s, uh, he was really into the whole uh, evaluation and um, description of the Zen, the Zen philosophy, um, like his first book was The Way of Zen at age 20 already, which is very precocious and, and you know, a bit formidable to have like a, a very intellectual scholarly book on he Zen. He was very ambitious. Yeah. yeah, completely. And you know where you can see the ambition? You can see it in his Saturn conjunction Pluto. Now, of course, you know, with Capricorn, the ruler of the chart is Saturn. So there Saturn is very important. And when Pluto hits it, it intensifies it. Every time you see Pluto conjunction, it intensifies the placement, it elevates it to a much stronger frequency, a stronger vibration. So it means um, he was overly serious, overly, you could say capricious, you know, like Capricorn, capricious in his earlier life. And the religion has a lot to do with that because Saturn rules structure, rules rules, <laughs> rules rules, you know. So religion is really all about rules, a guidance system for your morals and ethics and stuff like that. So it makes sense why he was into monasteries and stuff like that, because he was looking for that. Uh, I need to obey the rules. This is kind of where I take my power back, Pluto. And on the other hand, this is also showing. When you have a conjunction, it's not just, okay, the influence of the other planet is coming in. It's also one planet is fighting with the other planet because they're in the same position. Like one of them is trying to rule over the other, trying to influence each other. So who's going to win? <laughs> so here you have also the influence of Pluto being influenced by Saturn. So this is a guy who is very serious about getting famous or powerful, influential in some way. Maybe a lot of his teachings were also about people getting into power. Hmm. At least he'll be very, very um, driven to somehow find a position where he can influence other people. Pluto is about that influence that we have and we do not normally show that on the outside. We keep that desire for ourselves. We don't want other people to see what we're trying to accomplish because power is to gain some influence over other people, which is about pretty much getting famous, for example. And I'm only mentioning this uh, because when we look at charts like this, and we analyze these gurus, we will meet Pluto quite a lot if they are indeed famous. Because Pluto in ancient Greek means riches. Rich. So Pluto mm -hmm. shows you how you get rich. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned yeah, earlier. Sorry, what, what were you saying? Oh, sorry, just, just for Saturn. 
like how he gets rich, right? Mm -hmm. He gets rich because he's uh, teaching other people uh, a structured based way of being. Yes. Looking at things, perception. And perception is a Virgo thing again with this moon. Uh, you mentioned before um, he he was, you know, very into talking about what what do you want, you know, and and focusing on you know what he wants, um, you know, in life and how to get from A to B, and be successful. And interestingly, in one of his recordings, it's literally called "What do you want?" <laughs> so in a way, having reached that himself, he he he's trying to um, share that with others. And he simply said, you know, establish what, what you want and get paid for it, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's very simple and logical, but most people don't go about thinking that way in terms of, oh, what do I want? What do I really want to do? And go for it and you'll even get, you know, a fee for for doing that, you know. And it's not a selfish philosophy. It's very simple. It's him being honest. It's yes. him expressing the child. Now, that's a very good point that you're making. When a person is being honest, they're showing the child in the most obvious way. If a person is trying to hide themselves, they're also going to hide the child. So when you have Mars and Capricorn in the first house conjunction sun, like it couldn't possibly be more prominent for Mars than that. And of course, you're going to have to tell other people that the way you operate is by you just do what you want. And that matters the most to the Sun conjunction Mars person. If he didn't express that, then it just wouldn't be him, right? He has to be himself. And that's what he's trying to teach with his teachings, how to be yourself mm -hmm. unapologetically. Yeah. Another thing, however, about that is that he has South Node in Leo. So the South Node shows what you already mastered. It's almost like your ancestors have adapted to being this way and this adaptation was passed on to you. And this adaptation is to operate from the heart, to operate from self-love and knowing that self-validation is a very important thing. And also, of course, being in front of an audience and talking to them and knowing how to be liked by them. And um, with a North and an Aquarius, I guess it shows his need to sell things in a way where everybody agrees with him. You know, he wants to be very, very uh, agreeable, actually. Which is also the Midhaven and Libra at the same time. Now, the Midhaven, every time you look at a guru, a teacher, a public person, look at the Midhaven as if you're looking at their son. Like, literally, they're actually going to be almost more the Midhaven than their son in the way they are public. Yeah. And it's in Libra. So, this is the marketplace. This is the guy that has something, a product. We're thinking about how do I sell this product in a way that reaches as many people as possible. And for that reason, he was speaking to an audience which was reflective of the collective that operated at the time of when he was doing these recordings. So it shows that whatever style he has, keep in mind that his style of teaching is simply what people wanted him to teach. They wanted this. That's what the Libra does. Libra is about, I don't have any wants. I don't care. In the public, professional sense. Only what you want, how you want me to be. That's what matters. In the way I sell things to you. So he has been looking always at, okay, what does the collective think? How do they think? Yeah. So if people criticize him for that, they're basically just criticizing him for doing what people wanted him to do. Pretty mm -hmm. much, yeah, in that sense. 
So he had a, a strong sense of the the zeitgeist, basically. Yes. Of uh, almost like a chameleon, just sensing what message the people needed to hear at the time, because that was what mainly the sixties and seventies during the the countercultural revolution, uh, when people were trying to transcend the limitations of government and experiment with psychedelics and and try to break free of you know, the old system and there was that song uh was it age of aquarius that came out in the 70s as well so just thinking to contextually so much was going on simultaneously alongside alan watts like um with Ram Das and T Tim Leary, and it was a, a sort of brigade of um, countercultural free thinkers. Yeah. Yeah. Dating. And one thing I want to share about what I see of Alan Watts. Yeah. He, he wasn't originally when he started in his 20s, he wasn't doing any of this, not primarily for money, because he has an eight house south node. The eight house people have problems with ownership, with property. They don't really want to have money in that sense. They're very much like, ah, oh, things keep changing. We just come and go and they don't save. They don't collect. So if someone has this in second house north node, like he does, which is about physical property, they are very likely to get very financially um, well done in the later years. Because then they start to think more about their personal values, mm. how to gain property and money and stuff like that. Also, because he has Lilith and Taurus, He'll be project. He he'll be one who rejected money very very much until his thirties. With Lilith, you see in the chart every time. What does a pe person get taught by parents, peers, society, culture? What they are supposed to reject within this, themselves. So here, the body, the physical needs, the physical values, they were rejected at the beginning, and later he became very very passionate about these values. And some of that passion, we can see perhaps in some way with the alcoholism that came for him later, because we can also talk about that. He was an alcoholic, right? Yeah. So especially after, sorry, how much time do we have left, by the way? We have eight minutes left. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to quickly touch on that. Like um, after such a successful career, uh, and gain, gaining a lot of um, public acclaim, et cetera. What do you think in his chart pointed him towards that sort of decline into um, alcoholism, for instance? Yeah, so there's, I look at trauma indicators that bring up the childhood conditioning that is responsible for later behavior. One of his placements is Pluto conjunction Saturn, which I mentioned earlier before, but it didn't talk about the trauma aspect of that. In trauma psychology, Pluto is about guilt, repression, shame, and Saturn is about fear and protection, self-preservation. So he was trying to keep something down. And it's in the seventh house of relationships. So this is someone who has a lot of difficulties in relationships. He goes from relationship to relationship, but he finds himself in power struggles over and over again. So mm -hmm. One person is trying to gain the upper hand with Pluto in the seventh. And with Saturn there, he's very committed, actually. These are very loyal people. So if they have trouble leaving those relationships. And there's also at the same time a karmic lesson involved that a good relationship for long term is very much desired by these types of people. Mm. Now, I don't know much about his relationships later, but... The Saturn Pluto conjunction has a tendency to depression. And it's a very, uh, it's a kind of codependent placement. 
where you feel like you'll have to be uh, the provider and you'll have to be very much in control of your relationships. Mm. So that could be an issue. The other thing is Karen and Pisces in the second house. Karen in the second house is also very much about rejecting one's own desires or feeling guilty about having those desires that are more physical in nature. You know, like the food that you eat, the um, the physical things that you buy, the luxury that you enjoy. So later in life, you wanted to rebel against that, that previous conditioning where he was told that he was not allowed to indulge. Mm -hmm. So he, he, want, he went basically from a earlier life where he was all about absence and abstinence mm -hmm. and later life completely pendulating to the opposite yes to try to balance that energy yeah and, the, and in in the end he he turned out to be very earthy as according to his uh capricorn almost yeah uh, and you know he was often criticized for being a womanizer um but having also looked at his love letters or his letters in general you can sh you can see the genuine affection, the deep affection he had for his his I think his wife as as well. He was married. I think that makes sense. I think so, you can actually believe that. Yeah. <laughs> like for example, I say every time you see an, a behavior that corresponds to the chart, then believe them. Yeah, because he has Venus in the twelfth house, which is the most selfless placement when it comes to relationships yeah. causes the most uh, there's the least amount of boundaries and the most amount of compassion from as far as Venus goes yeah. now another problem that he had was Venus conjunction Pholus now Pholus is normally not touched by most astrologers same as with Nessus and Lilith the centaurs, not everyone talks about them, but I find them very important because they show you more about things that get fragmented from the psyche, things where we are split and we are not looking at that aspect. So in Venus, a part of this Venus aspect, the relationship aspect was damaged. Venus is not only about relationships though, it's also about your needs. Like, um, I need to eat food is a Venus trait. I need to go out in nature. I need to have beauty around me. I need to have a nice, cozy home. That's also Venus. And when Venus is conjunction flawless, that means the person, uh, they feel crippled somehow in this aspect. It's like they have trouble accessing their needs. And you see this kind of aspect a lot when someone is extremely detached where they may say, I I have needs, I don't know, I don't know my needs. <laughs> and this this goes back to the psychology of guilt, shame. Like you can make videos about that kind of sort of thing. But every time you see indicators of guilt in the person's chart, try to see what role that plays in their addictions, if they have any, the compensatory mechanisms that they use to cope with attention behind that placement. Wow. So time-wise, how are we doing? Um, we have only three minutes left, so let's wrap it up. Wrap it up, yeah, absolutely. No, obviously, um, I mean, we could go on and do a part two um, if people are interested, maybe further down the line. But for now, I think that covers a decent amount regarding Alan. <laughs> And um, yeah, no, just what a great character, ultimately. Um, I'll just always see him as a very jovial, you know, sage. But, you know, he had his own shadows, you know, but um, his message was well-meaning and um, pretty insightful in terms of the whole cosmic game. <laughs> I personally, I've also watched a lot of his videos, like the recordings. I also really like them. For me personally, I always liked the mental aspect. I mean, even you could debate about that. I have Mercury in Gemini. 
Venus in Gemini. So if somebody is mercurial, more mental, it's in my chart. I like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I do like it because he's very down to earth. He's very practical. And we need more of a uh, practical spirit where people just tell you this is just the function it provides, uh, the body is playing this role, and they're playing this role because it's a game. And so just play the game, you know, keep it things very, very simple. So that Absolutely. was his gift to us to keep things simple. Yeah. 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 Well, George, thank you so much, really. Um, it's been great. And I hope it's been informative and inspiring and insightful for everyone else. And uh, here's to more astro psychology interviews to come. So, Georges, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. May the force be with you. <laughs>